the seminar by Professor Siddiq Wahid, adjunct fellow of ICM. I'm happy to be here. Um, I um, am delighted to be able to speak, um, in part because as soon as I returned, I called up uh, Dr. Devashi Chaudhary and I said, listen, you know, we've got to talk about Xinjiang a lot more uh, because of, you know, what I saw. And he immediately reacted, of course, ICS was gracious enough, even though I ditched you uh, on the 12th of October, <laughs> you know, to say, come on over, let's sit down, let's chat uh, about it. Um, I um, want to uh, sort of uh, do something which I don't usually do because I'm technologically challenged uh, in many, many ways, but show you some slides because I think that that is really the only way one can capture, um, you know, what is happening there. Uh, albeit, uh, you know, there's nothing sort of in terms of the imagery uh, because it's all, you know, very calm and things, but I think that there were some moods and so forth that needed capturing and talking about. And so therefore, I said, let me take the plunge. And I asked my wife, who's not technologically challenged, to put something together, and I hope it all works. Um, how did I get to go? Because as we all know, Xinjiang is a difficult place to go. I'd been there several times, each time refrained from writing or speaking uh, about it too much, because I felt uh, that there was a challenge there in terms of, of one, you know, not affecting people that you meet, uh, but also selfishly wanting to go back um, and, and wanting to touch base again and again, um, you know, with Sinjan. Um, so, and last year, after I went under the ages of actually ICS once um, to Beijing and Kashgar uh, and then back, I felt it was rather constricted because I'd been there before and I thought I must get going again. Um, and I tried in 2016, uh, or was it early 70, I don't remember, I tried to go again um, and I was turned down on a visa. Uh, so I was despondent and I thought, well, okay, you know, let me try. And as it so happens, eight friends from the United States um, were planning on going to Xinjiang. And so since they knew that I knew uh, a little bit about uh, Central Asia, they said, you know, where should we go, what should we do? And for a lark, I made a suggestion, which I thought would be rather nice. Um, and that was to go to both Western Turkestan and Eastern Turkestan at the same time uh, mm -hmm. to see what was happening. It would be like going to Ladakh and Lhasa, um, you know, in, in Central Tibet at the same time to see, you know, the mood and what it is, because after all, they're the same people, linguistically, culturally, and so forth. Um, and lo and behold, it came through. You know, they, they were able to organize the tour and so forth, and eventually they told me that there were eight of them going. And uh, uh, now, having planned the itinerary, I was a bit envious, and I said, listen, you know, I mean, this is terrible that you guys get to go, and I don't, they, they said, why don't you join, you know? Um, so I looked it up um, and I decided, yes, I mean, it would be worth it and joined. Um, they in, it involved, I mean, I've gone to both Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan and Xinjiang, all three places, uh, several times over the last 20 years. But very briefly, um, and as I said, without, without uh, raising any suspicions, particularly in Xinjiang, um, and, and to some extent in the early days in, in Uzbekistan as well, and um, um, so I was anxious to go because of the news that was coming out of there. So it involved a slight of hand a little bit in the sense that I applied for my visa in the United States with my friends. Of course, then I was diverted back to Delhi. And uh, until the last day, I held my breath because we didn't know whether I was going to get. And literally on the day before I was going to go, I got my visa. So off I went. You know, and and I think that um, I'm I'm very glad for having been there. Um, the structure of uh, today's talk that I want to give is very simple. Is that first something about uh, whom who the uh, Uyghur are, uh, apart from the last thirty years, 
uh, you know, when, when they came, started to come into the picture on the international scenario as well as uh, the domestic scenario and things. Um, and as you know, 30 years ago or almost 30 years ago, there was the breakup of something called um, the Cold War regime. And when that happened, uh, Xinjiang was also affected, you know, um, as was, you know, obviously the Soviet Union, which collapsed, Mongolia, Tibet, Xinjiang, Manchuria, you know, Eastern and Western Turkestan, um, as, as, I mean, Western Turkestan as well, Afghanistan, and in fact, uh, South Asia, JNK, Eastern Europe, the Balkans, you know, it all, uh, they were all affected. And I think that uh, the idea is, you know, what, what are we facing now as a result of it? Um, and that's what I hope to try and demonstrate uh, during the talk. Secondly, um, what does the situation in Central Eurasia or Central Asia uh, tell us about the new world order, which seems to be still in the making, thanks in large part to Trump? Um, and, and his uh, antics that are going on and things. Um, and what does it mean in particular in Central Asia for the Uyghurs? Mm -hmm. What does it mean for the region? And what does it mean for the world at large? I think that that's a question that I would like to sort of lay on the table a little bit for all, for all of us hopefully to discuss, uh, apart from the descriptives um, that I'm going to talk about. Uh, the first time that I met Uyghurs was not as a student, uh, a postgraduate school student of um, Central Asia, uh, nor was it um, 30 years ago, it was as a child. Um, I was in Kashmir and I remember going in the 1960s to a place called the Yarkandi Sarai at Safakadal in Kashmir. Downtown Shrinagar. People who know Kashmir will know. And these were Uyghurs who had fled to Kashmir between the middle years of the 1940s when Chinese nationalists and communists were fighting a civil war. And as that war and World War II wound down, both factions were expelling dissenting, dissenting natives, uh, sort of, you know, selectively, and non natives en masse uh, because they were upset at potential British India inspired troublemakers. My father's uncle, Mukaram Ahmed Radu, was among these uh, non-natives who was expelled, and he had to leave Yarkand, minus his wife, who was Uyghur at the time, um, and never saw her again. Uh, this was a family property that we acquired in the late uh, 19th century as traders out of Leh. Uh, my then interest in the Uyghur, however, was not spurred by this uh, sort of family connection. Um, rather, it was because the Uyghur Dastarkhan on the day of Eid was the most lavish that you would see. And we would go there and the elderly people would stuff our pockets with dried foods uh, and then urge us to take whatever you know, we couldn't eat at the time and stuff our pockets even more. So it was a great uh, sort of place to go. Uh, it was also, I would admire uh, two things, the hats that they wore, which were quite amazing, um, and the boots that they wore, which were leather boots that went up to the knees. Uh, you know, very soft leather and so forth. I'm happy to say now I've acquired both um, okay. over a couple of trips. Um, these were refugees. You know, and it fell very much uh, in a sympathetic uh, sort of realm for me because my own maternal grandparents had fled Lhasa in the mid-50s uh, because of the Chinese People's Republic uh, or the PLA coming in to Tibet uh, in Lhasa. Uh, my maternal grandparents who had settled there from Ladakh for over 100, 200 years, you know, uh, in in uh, central Tibet, um, and so there was a resonance at that fact. And I uh, I mentioned that just to give you an idea of or, or a reminder of what was happening in the Eurasian landmass at about that time. Some very critical things were happening. <clears throat> um, 
But they were, of course, uh, the latest kind of espresso uh, coffee, very good, um, and things. And, of course, Registan Square uh, in Samarkand, the iconic uh, sort of image. And there, from there, we flew directly uh, into uh, Urumqi. Um, I have these three men of Uzbekistan, and I want to talk about that a little bit later, but I thought this was a very captivating scene uh, where it looks like there are three generations uh, represented at the same time. One, which is wearing very traditional dress. Um, secondly, uh, a person who has shed some of his traditional dress. Uh, and the third one who seems to have done it all, you know, shed everything completely. And I thought that was a nice image. Uh, and I was able to capture it. And I actually enjoyed taking photographs from that perspective because you look at it from a slightly different eye. Um, we flew into Urumqi. Now bear in mind, I was flying with uh, eight friends of mine. And so whenever they talked about it, I said, listen, you know, hotels are terrible, the food is bad, you know, you're going to, and, and I flew in, when we flew into Urumqi, I was completely taken aback because of the changes that had happened, not in the last 20 years, but in the last eight years, you know, where I was able to go into the city a little bit. And so again, like Tashkent, it was very uninteresting by now because it had this modern architecture. But we stayed at not a sort of, you know, Dhaba sort of class uh, hotel, but rather the Radisson Blue. I mean, it was, and it was quite luxurious, um, you know, by, by any standard. So this is where we went and we looked at uh, the scenario um, and so forth from that perspective. So this is the only picture I have of Orumchi. I thought that it would be fair to present it. Uh, in, and, and there were many, many buildings like this. Um, I think the slides have been mixed up completely. Um, let me just, uh, yeah. At any rate, what we did is that we went, uh, oh, I just wanted to illustrate this uh, uh, sort of thing, is that uh, I was reading Kaplan, uh, Robert Kaplan, if those of you are familiar, journalist who writes, I think very insightfully, I, I don't agree with him completely on a lot of things, but, uh, you know, writes very, and he talks about 2016 when he went, and he says, one day I witnessed hundreds of Uyghur men with beards and embroidered hats emerge from the 15th century Itka Mosque in the center of Kashgar. Two years ago, you know, I went a year and a half ago, and I must say, I didn't witness hundreds of Uyghur men with colorful hats, but there was prayer in the mosque. There was, you know, there were things going on. So. I was astonished at the change that you're going to see now because it's not, you know, the argument that I would like to make is that it's not the change that persecutes. It's the pace of the change that is forced. You know, and Urumqi, uh, I mean, uh, sorry, Kashgar is completely different from even a year ago, year and a half ago that I went. You know, and I was astonished at how different it was. You know, it's the pace of the change that is that that you know will ultimately result unless something happens in a cultural genocide of proportions that I don't think I could imagine or perhaps don't want to try and imagine. Um, oh, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Um, we were taken to a museum right away. You know, uh, the first move. We had a guide, uh, the guide uh, who happened to be Uyghur, uh, but he was very circumspect in everything that he talked about and things. At any rate, um, inside the museum, we are given a tour of 13 ethnicities, you know, that existed uh, in uh, uh, Xinjiang. Um, and, and of the 13 ethnicities, was one called Russian, which had 25 members. So my point being here is that there was a divide and rule, whereby it was drummed in again and again to every minority culture that you're not unique. You know, there are several, 50 plus, you know, like you here in China, you know. Um, I uh, also took this one photograph in the museum because 
it is uh, uh, you know for washing hands uh, before you eat uh, you know in in a private home and it reminded me of Kashmir because we have Deshna uh, in Kashmir uh, where, where before you eat the wasman or before you go to a formal meal uh, at a house or something you you talk about it so it reminded me of that and it reminded me of cultural connections many of them and and there were much of that I'll talk less about it because I think that uh, let me go through it. Uh, after that, we went directly out into the uh, desert, you know, and uh, where there were battery camels, you know, and we went to what might be called uh, ancient, um, you know, uh, sort of Xinjiang uh, and that territory, uh, which was obviously uh, Buddhist at the time, Manichaean afterwards, um, and uh, other religions included including Nestorian. It should, I mean, a point should be made that people were f often fleeing to Central Asia because of religious persecution in, in various parts of the, of the world, or, or the nearby world. Um, this is uh, a, a photograph of near Rawak, uh, which is uh, where uh, the stupa is, uh, which is all buried underground, and they're planning on digging on it. So you couldn't walk on the ground and on a rather rickety sort of uh, scaffolding that you walked, which was encircled, and it's quite a large area, so it's going to be interesting to see uh, when. And by the way, this was discovered first by uh, Oral Stein, um, if many of you will recognize that name. After that, we went to Yar Khoto, or the Cliff City, um, another ancient site uh, where uh, the Uyghurs came in and set go, uh, uh, a, a, an empire of their own. Uh, which lasted for uh, between 580 and 12, I mean, uh, eight, uh, 850 and 1250. So a 400 year empire uh, that was ruled out of uh, this place in, in the deserts, you know, of thing. Um, the, I gave the name uh, Yarkhoto, which is the Uyghur name or the Turkic name of the place, which means cliff city because it's built literally on a plateau uh, with two rivers running on either side of it, and Chao Ho, if I'm pronouncing my Mandarin <laughs> badly, uh, which is two cities, I mean, uh, the city of two rivers, uh, alluding to the two rivers that flow. So it also sort of formed a protected place, um, you know, well protected. And this is a street in this uh, place, uh, you're talking about now, uh, anywhere, you know, as I said, from the town period, uh, 850 onwards up to the Mongol uh, period. Um, it's been very well preserved, I must say, you know, and we go on. Um, we saw a lot of Chinese tourists who were encouraged to go from the mainland, shall we say, or power centers into over here. Uh, and so I, mean, I, I thought that they were respectful. I didn't see them. I didn't, it was not the equivalent of the ugly American or, you know, in, in terms of tourism and so forth, very respectful and going uh, towards the stupa. And some remnants uh, of the stupa that were still there, um, and I'm not an archaeologist by any stretch uh, or an art historian uh, of the imagination, uh, but uh, there were things that obviously were bodhisattvas, uh, you know, in niches, uh, in a classic uh, sort of um, grand stupa style um, and things. And then there was a small museum uh, like the Chinese only can do, uh, which would have remnants that were taken from those cliffs and brought back in, uh, very close by, right, right next to it. So I'll just go through these. Uh, the next place that we went to was uh, in a while. Well, this is not in sequence, but another place that we went to was uh, Tuyuk, a village in the Turfan uh, area. Uh, again, uh, you see the barbed wire and a mosque in the distance, um, and it was a stream that ran through the town. Um, grapevines, of course, grapes are very famous uh, there, pomegranate grapes, fruit of any kind in Central Asia. And a tourist shop in Tuyu, in the middle of nowhere, you know, made very nicely with uh, just dried fresh raisins, uh, which I think, uh, you know, were amazing, I brought home some. And it was, I was thinking that I should have brought some up here for the tea session or whatever uh, afterwards um, and things. 
and uh, we, uh, there was also a village mosque um, in, in the village itself. Of course, now we've already come into uh, the very modern period, uh, modern, I mean, 14th century onwards, um, and things like that. Um, and this was an interesting photograph because uh, those of us who are familiar with archaeology in that area will know uh, a book called uh, Foreign Devils on the Silk Road by Peter Hopkirk. Uh, where he talks about people who came and, um, you know, took away his time, the, uh, the biggest of them, um, you know, took away his stuff. And uh, the Chinese signs, which unfortunately I didn't take a photograph of, very, say very plainly, this is where von Le Coq, uh, who was one of Stein's greatest rivals uh, in archaeological exploration, uh, you know, to use the euphemism. Um, uh, it says, this is where von Le Coq lived when he stole all the stuff, you know, from um, Tunhuang as well as from Beziklik, which is not very far from here. Um, Beziklik being beautiful caves or beautiful place, um, and it was uh, hundreds of caves. Again, not unlike uh, Tunhuang, which has attained to much greater fame because of the <coughs> manuscripts that were found there. Um, after that, we went to the Tashka Bazaar, which is a sight to see, you know. Again, I found a huge change since uh, I had been there uh, about, you know, I, I think when, when I went with ICS, we were not allowed to go there, or it wasn't on or something at uh, that time. But, um, you know, uh, this time, it was a huge change. There was still, I mean, it was still large, it was still sort of thing, but, uh, you know, there were tourists flooding it, and I took this photograph particularly because you see the impunity with which the tourists seem to intrude uh, onto the scenario of people doing a very normal thing which is eating their meal you know on a uh, Sunday market uh, sort of visit and things and some pictures of the bazaar itself. Uh, yaks uh, were to be found there um, and things. Um, and uh, yeah, sheep, cows, I mean, there was um, a bunch of pomegranates, um, you know, that was sold and literally, you know, by, like, you wouldn't, nobody would buy less than 10 kilos, you know, and things. So there's plenty of food, there's plenty of stuff uh, to eat and things. And um, what uh, my friends started calling um, Muslim wine, which is pomegranate juice. Uh, that was being pressed right then and there, and then you ate it. It was very good, it was very, very um, tasty stuff. Vegetables, you know, the, the natural abundance with which Central Asia is seen. Different towns, for example, Khotan was known for its walnuts. Yarkan was known for its, or is known for its almonds. Uh, you know, and it goes on, Hami, of course, for its melons and things. Uh, but, you know, Kashgar has, uh, in some parts, become very trendy. Um, this is nothing, you know, like this uh, 20 years ago. Um, and things. So bread is sold in various things, and then bread in the village, uh, which we went. And uh, if, uh, I know some of us are from Kashmir here, and if you look at that, I mean, you couldn't say that this was not such I mean, you know, exactly the same bread that we eat in the afternoon in Kashmir. Um, there's also, uh, but interestingly, this Sochuvaru is called Girda, uh, and Girda is called Sochuvaru. <laughs> so I was, uh, they've got the names, well, I don't know whether they've got the name confused or we've got the names confused, but somebody's confused on that because <coughs> the names uh, seem to have interchanged. And uh, Girda is sort of like a flat bread, um, and it's also done in a tandoor, and usually eaten in the mornings and things. Um, next, I want to show you what I've named the flagged mosques of Xinjiang, you know, and every mosque that you went, including the ones that I've already shown you, would have a Chinese flag flying over them, you know. Not just that, but also <coughs> signs, you know, two signs which were very prominent. One sign, love the party, love the country, you know, and the second sign is, no visiting in the prayer time. Now, I was impressed by this because I thought, oh, okay, that means that tourists are not allowed during prayer times so as not to disturb. But our guide said, no, that's not for you. You can go in. But it's meant for the Uyghurs. Is that you will not go in during prayer times. Yes, 
I mean, as well. and not only that, but you were not allowed to take water in during prayer times uh, because you could do a quick ablution. You know, uh, in in uh, Islam, every time before you pray, you have to do a quick ablution. You could do a quick ablution and pray. You know, inside. So to prevent that, you were not allowed in during prayer times. Um, again, the mosque in Tuyuk had a Chinese flag and all the signs, again, you know, all, as did the main mosque in Kashgar, which you see over here uh, with a flag right in the middle. All these mosques would have a uh, sort of, you know, uh, barrier so that you couldn't enter it, you know, without first registering in some way or the other. You know, uh, this Sorry. <coughs> this was a mosque in um, the old city, within the walls of the old city of Kashgar. And I saw a sign and it said the dream of Kashgar inside and it had been turned into a bar, you know, for people to go and drink. Um, apparently it was not very successful. Because it was, um, you know, the, the population there of Uyghurs is very sparse, not that they would go into drink. And so the uh, people who were uh, Han, you know, would be hesitant to go in there uh, simply because, you know, they didn't feel safe necessarily at certain times of the year. So it's not, and, and this made me think um, is that, um, and I say, who says we don't learn from history? Uh, because this is exactly what the Soviet Union did in Western Turkestan, um, in places like Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Kazakhstan, and other places uh, where there were Muslim mosques. And these have bounced back after 75 years and are now back to being converted to mosques. You know, so there is a resilience there also that I think we can still be hopeful about. You know, some scenes from the old Kashgar and here a picture of a woman. Now, one of the things that we notice is you're discouraged from wearing traditional clothes. And women may not wear the headscarf. They're not, I mean, you're stripped of your headscarf if you see it. This woman was wearing the headscarf. Then one of my friends was taking a picture and she quickly took off her headscarf just to make sure that nobody would see her without, with her headscarf on. You know, so it's very hard to know, you know, what it takes for a person to think in this manner. What kind of, what kind of, um, you know, fear do you instill for people to think in this way? That they would take off the scarf and be able to think in a certain direction at a, you know, a, a, at a critical point like this. Um, you know, Uzbeks. Uh, I, I show this. Uh, Uzbeks are struggling, you know, struggling because they were obviously under a dictatorship under uh, Islam Karimov, uh, their last uh, sort of president, first <coughs> president, and who died about a year and a half, two years ago, <coughs> and things. Um, but the new man, Shokat Mirzov, I think, uh, is uh, already loosening up you know, for some reason. And so therefore you could see this variety. It's not what I would call a thriving democracy by any stretch, uh, you know, even now. But at least you have this difference, you know, uh, of, of what people wear and how they choose to wear, how they choose to present themselves, you know, to, to the public in general, which is absent in a place like Xinjiang. You know, here you see this old man. Now I was watching him, and that's why I took the picture. I thought I had taken several, but I guess I just took this one and another one, which you'll see in a minute, or another two of him alone, where the woman was staring at him in Kashgar. Why? Because it was such an unfamiliar sight. You know, in Kashgar today, a year and a half after I had last gone there, you know, which was astounding to me, is that that, that would be the case and things. Um, and, you know, the, I think that when people, this, I saw this man not throughout that whole time, and in fact throughout the visit, it was very 
difficult. I at least didn't see anybody over the age of 45 or 50 who was smiling, laughing, or whatever, you know, or happy in any sense, you know. And it's, call it the weight of change, call it the weight of being hollowed out, you know, in, in, from your identity as such, is that I don't know how they react, you know. So, um, and it reminded me of a sort of, you know, uh, Polish poet and philosopher's uh, observation uh, many years ago. And that was that, you know, he was criticizing Stalin uh, as the killing of the inner man and the exteriorization of everything. That was its appeal. For without the inner life, there would be less for a person to think and worry about. You know, and I felt that this is what was going on in Sinjar, is that the hollowing out of the inner person, you know, or in, in one way or another uh, that is happening. Um, as I said, I mean, no one is starving. And in fact, there is more, people were telling us, you know, that there's a lot of food, you know, it's very good, uh, abundant, and so forth. No one is starving. In fact, more food than they used are used to, and it was never bereft of food, you know, Central Asia and things. And this is a photograph in the bazaar of a person selling pulao, uh, which has some ridiculously little money, you know, and you'd get a grateful which would keep you going. I think it was sort of just soaking in ghee, um, you know, that, and, and it would keep you going for a long time, I'm sure, you know. And this, and by the time we, go, I took this photograph, went back and came back, it was already empty and there were filling it up again, you know, um, and things. So, and at the end of the tour, we were treated to something called the, um, what's um, it was, uh, you know, sort of like a farewell dinner, you know, and things. And we were taken to a, a place uh, to have baking duck, you know. And there was the most curious sign, which I must say I spotted and immediately took a picture of, where the translation of the first line of the Mandarin is underneath it, and I don't know if you can read, but it says, constipation, roast duck. You know, so we were all racking our brains to try and say, well, see, what does it mean, you know, and things. And it, it was like, you know, it was a very, in, in fact, a fascinating trip, but also a very sad trip. And one of my friends, who's particularly sensitive, <coughs> I remember that, or two of them, in fact, missed half the sightseeing in Xinjiang because they were so depressed at seeing what they've seen, you know, and they had no idea that they wouldn't see it. You know. So it was, not, and so therefore, it this sign reminded me of my own um, grandfather's two brothers who went after having fled uh, from Lhasa. They went back to Lhasa, I think, in the. Uh, mid uh, early to mid 80s or so they were still alive then and they went back and they were taken all over uh, Tibet uh, Lhasa, Gyantse, Shigatse and other parts you know of, of central Tibet and they came back and I remember asking them you know I'd come back from the States and was talking to them uh, about you know their visit uh, obviously very curious about it and they said you know everything is so abundant sampa which is the barley flour you know there's lots of all over the place and things and and then they said one thing and they said but nothing quite tastes the same you know and i thought that was a very telling statement to make you know nothing quite tastes the same and i think that that is what we are looking at in terms of things that may be happening. Um, all nationalities shall embrace tightly, just like pomegranate seeds. This is Xi Jinping's, apparently, his line for how they should all stay together. Uh, you know, except that the tightness of the embrace seems to be sort of, you know, one uh, nationality as such, rather than the claim to 56 others. And I think, um, and I, I just had to take it. Why, by the way, when we were going, there were police everywhere. There was army everywhere. You know, and I'll illustrate how and why, you know, in a little bit. But uh, 
we were told expressly by the guide, for God's sake, don't take any pictures of them. You know, don't take any pictures of them because I will be in trouble if you do that. And that was a standard line of this. So we respected that, not a single picture. But no mosque that we went to, no site that we went to was minus police. Yeah. And at any rate, if we had, as I will tell you a little bit later, uh, we would not have been able to bring it out, and bring out those pictures at all. So here, it reminded me that, and it was in the context of surveillance state uh, and and what what can we do to reverse that process? Is some an observation that Simon Huntington again somebody I don't sort of see eye to eye with in, in a lot of ways, um, you know, said many years ago in 1968. He said that the most important political distinction among countries concerns not their form of government but their degree of government or their degree of you know the degree to which they govern control and rule over. And I think that this was illustrated very well uh, during uh, this visit. So that uh, is the sort of, uh, you know, illustrated uh, portion of it, if, if you will. I, we can have the lights back on. I don't have any more slides. Uh, but the question remains, and that's why I said that because I ditched uh, ICS uh, on, on the 12th of October, uh, it was uh, the question concerning the rise of the surveillance state and what we can do. And I had made my notes then, which I still have, and I thought, let me just sort of, you know, wrap it up with that. And that is that Xinjiang is under duress, and with the emergence of the uh, surveillance state, uh, what might other states be able to do to control it? I think that that was the question um, that was posed. Um, and. You know, my, my uh, sort of response to that is that we cannot do much, you know, because of the prevailing conditions locally, regionally, and internationally, you know, is that, for example, I mean, surveillance is a part of life, right, today. I mean, who has the greatest surveillance ability today is England, which has one surveillance camera for every 11 citizens, you know, where they can at Heathrow Airport, pick out a person with a particular tattoo, you know, out of that entire crowd, if they need to, you know. Um, we have every state in the world striving for surveillance. Uh, the United States, we don't even know how much. You know, over here, we have Aadhaar card, you know, and it's uh, sort of propagation in, in various ways um, and so forth. And I think that that really is no longer a question, you know, and as to what the, the uh, sort of, you know, the states, other states can do about it, very little, you know, because it's the power centers that are doing it. You know, it's the power centers that are propagating the need for this kind of surveillance, you know. So, I, I mean, I really don't know. Uh, how many people can point a finger at China for the kind of surveillance that they did? And let me close with the kind of surveillance that that happens in a place of China from just our experience. And I'm giving you three very specific uh, illustrations. Getting petrol in Xinjiang. We were driving from one place to another. Uh, we were in a what's called a minibus. And when we got to the petrol station, it was ringed by barbed wire. You couldn't go. All the passengers had to get out. The driver had to take out his ID card, show it, be photographed with it, go in, fill it up only by, fill up the, uh, the gas only by uh, sort of, you know, giving them uh, his ID card again. You know, and that meanwhile the passengers got out on the other, on this side of the barrier, walked around, and then we would go to the other side. He would exit using his ID card, all of which was recorded. You know, and then we would drive off. We asked the guy, "What's the scoop here? I mean, why do you need this? It's because they're afraid that there'll be petrol bombs made." And he said that if you, and this was in the bus, you know, when we were going. Um, he said, if 
you consume more petrol than is normal for you from workplace to home and back, bazaar, whatever, you know, you will get a visit at home to ask you why did you need that extra petrol. You know, I thought that was a scary thought, you know, is that, I mean, you could get it next day. The other incident was face recognition. We had to go through it. I mean, you have to go through face recognition. So when you enter, you go through face recognition. When you exit, you go through face recognition. But you also go through face recognition when you go to each of the sites, I mean, the tourist sites that you go to. You know, and not only that, but sometimes you have to take a photograph of yourself with your passport in front of you, which the guy, I mean, the policeman, I guess there was a policeman, would take the photograph of you holding up your passport and when you entered the site and when you exit the site. Again, we asked the guy, guide as to why this was happening. It was to make sure that you follow the itinerary. And if a person is absent from three sites in a row, you know, which is like, we did six a day, it seemed like, you know. If you go from three sites in a row, you're questioned as to where was he or she, why was he or she not there at that site, in those sites at that time, you know. But more scary was at one point where one of our friends was arguably, you know, very young looking for her age and everything, took a photograph, I mean, was getting face recognition, and it would not tally with her passport because the passport was admittedly a terrible photograph. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it would not match. And we all started laughing, and we started talking about, you know, okay, we'll see you, we'll bring you food and whatever, you know, and things. But, and eventually, I think after about 15 minutes, she was let go. You know, um, because it was clearly an American passport and it was, you know, an issue. Walked out, you know, and I was just thinking, we were all discussing that what if it was an Uyghur woman? What would he or she have done, you know, under the circumstances? Because where would they go? You know, so that was the other thing uh, that, and the third incident that I, think, uh, you know, we should talk about, is leaving Xinjiang out of Urumqi. Um, one of my friends was a Japanese, and uh, stereotypically, he was ever since, he, him I know since school days, we've not seen each other for 45 years, you know, since school days, and he was taking photographs all along. He was stopped every, I mean, because he's a photographer, amateur albeit, but very good, you know, photographer, every single photograph of his was gone through. Every single one in his camera. He was asked as to where he had gone, so he said all the towns, and he said, okay, but the, but the person who was checking it said, you don't have any photographs of Shkashkar. He said, oh, it's in my, um, you know, the other uh, memory card. You know, so they went through that completely. <coughs> So we were thinking that if he had a single policeman's photograph or something, it was deleted immediately. I don't think he did, because he did take some photographs of some fighter jets or something, and they were deleted immediately. They stopped the plane from leaving Kashgar, uh, uh, Rumchi. Uh, this was on, on a previous visit to the place. So that was how strict it was. I had a passport. My passport was taken away because I had a passport with three books in it. Uh, the visa stamps, I think, had consumed all the space. And so, and they took it, kept it for about 15 minutes minimum, and photographed every single page. So I sort of asked, you know, and while I was waiting for the 15 minutes, I was thinking, my God, I hope they don't check my notebook, because it had nothing complimentary, you know, uh, about anything. Uh, and I was sort of trying to figure out where have I kept it, what have I written, was my handwriting clear, you know. And all these things, while it was going through it, you know, they took a photograph of every single one and said that they had taken that photograph just to keep it, you know, for later use. Um, if need, I mean, that was the explanation in sort of somewhat broken English that was explained to me. And then we were allowed to go on to the flight. You know, it was, so that's the kind of, you know, checkup. Where are we, you know, in all this? And I, you, 
contemplate, you know, and my first degree was in political theory. Um, and so I was just thinking that this is the ultimate nightmare of the Westphalian state, meeting the sort of, you know, uh, the oriental state idea, you know, without the two having interacted with well nigh 300 years, for, for well nigh 300 years. And that that is what we seem to be faced with, not just in China, you know, but in the entire sort of pre-colonial world, if you will, um, you know, and uh, the, the post-colonial states. And so it's something that I want to put in ta on the table because I think that um, it is that that we're struggling with uh, in this era of uh, emerging but not yet there new world order. So, thank you very much. I think I've gone over my time by 10 minutes, but I just thought, I'd love to interact. Thank you very much for that fascinating presentation and for going over time. <laughs> I didn't mind that at all. Uh, now the floor is open for the comments, questions. Uh, if it's all right with you, we'll combine Thank you for questions. I can't. I I it's on. It's on. Uh, I was in Urumqi, uh, Urumqi in 2001. In fact, the day 9-11 happened, I was in the town in the hotel. And I went all over the city. I wanted to go to Kashgar, etc., but there was no time. Our guests, our host said sorry about that. But there was not a single sign that I could see in the English language anywhere. <coughs> anywhere. So I was surprised to see the signs on these mosques. You know, don't do this and so forth. Uh, in English, for whose benefit was it? Was it for tourists or was it especially for some for someone like you? You know, here's this man coming from. <laughs> okay, that, that 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 is one. And I really don't know how to phrase this particular uh, observation come question of mine. After well, several years after the fall of the of Soviet Russia. I once drove from, I spent some time in Tashkent and other parts of Uzbekistan, where I saw life was very, very different <coughs> from what you might imagine a typical Muslim and civil society life to be. You know? Girls wearing mini skirts, pork being sold, not just beef, etc. And uh, people in no way appearing to be Islamic in terms of their appearance at least. Though I could sense that you know the, uh, that religion was making a comeback when you spoke to some people. Now, on the other hand, from there I drove some 300 kilometers past Tajikistan all the way to the northern part of Afghanistan, driving. I was not alone, there were others also. Maybe one or two mosques in this entire stretch of 300 kilometers. You know? There was no sign of it, and Soviet regime had died some 20 years prior. Roughly, roughly, or maybe 15. So 2005? Uh, uh, no, uh, 2001 or 2000, 2002. Okay. About that. So the year the Taliban government fell, and that's the year under So that, that's where I saw that. And, you know, which means that for 10 long years, the impact of the earlier system on the general life of the people was still visible and it was quite evident from the way they spoke, you know, in their, in their conversations. And in between, I met people in the village, I, I you know, I stopped the other night in some guest house or guest house or whatever, you know, chatting with them. There was no trace of any religiosity. There were anxieties about what life will bring, but that's common in many places. Yeah. So I'm a little bit surprised that 10 years after that event, 
the new, you know, the, the new religious return was not yet, you know, in full evidence. Right? But compared to that, what I see in your photographs surprises me. And the, the degree to which, you know, this, these controls you refer to are being made, what makes this fake so, so insecure? So what's happening on the ground politically among the Uyghurs? Because when I saw the Uyghurs in Urumqi that year, I went to the bazaar, they were laughing and smiling and joking. Mr. Bhattai was our Prime Minister as well. They said, oh, are you from India? So they, they said, yes, it's India. So just to test them, I said, well, do you know who our Prime Minister is? Of course, who doesn't know India? Who doesn't know that Mr. Bhattai is the Prime Minister? It was kind of you know, like a banter. So suddenly there's a big drop in the situation from, from, you know, from what I could say. Would you just comment? Yeah. Sure. Uh, please identify yourself first. <coughs> Hello, uh, my name is Srikati. Uh, just a quick question, like, as Sir asked, what is the actual security concern that the Chinese state have to have such a securitized environment? And to what end do they intend to have? Like, what is it that they going to achieve? Uh, and the second question, again, continuing with the first. If there is a crisis, do you think, given the heightened degree of securitization, the state made machinery would be able to handle a crisis without going overboard? <coughs> without Going overboard. Without going for an overview. Do you have another mic? Oh, I think anyone on this side? Well, we just, you know. Oh, yeah, please. Is <coughs> there any possibility whatsoever of conversation with some of the locals? Uh, and if so, what would be this? Uh, thank you. I'm Sanju Shivastra. I work on foreign policy, so we have research. Uh, my question is about uh, the new world order, which you, the kind of the talk which you ended with. Could you elaborate a bit more on that? Uh, what is the agenda of this new world order? Uh, like, uh, if uh, it is about just control, or it is about uh, putting people into following into certain agenda. And if that agenda is, then what is that agenda? And if someone is following that agenda, then uh, whether he or she will be able to survive peacefully, or even that is not possible. Thank you, good questions. Um, to answer your question, I think, um, is that, uh, <clears throat> uh, first of all, the signs were for tourists. You know, tourists are being permitted. They're permitted in Tibet, where too I have been. Um, and a lot of signs in Tibet um, on that. Um, B, the, it, it is also to a certain extent to intimidate tourists into not doing anything uh, that, um, you know, would somehow uh, leak, you know, what is happening um, and things. It, it seems like a very... Um, strange uh, sort of psychology, you know, to do that because obviously once they get back to their countries, they're free to speak, you know, and they will speak. Uh, except to say that, of course, it's not as if, you know, huge busloads of tourists are coming. You know, it's, it's uh, sparse and things, it's very controlled. And I think what one gets a sense uh, that they don't want anybody to talk about religion at all. I mean, you know, it's as simple as that. Um, and repeatedly, um, you know, the guide would say, please don't talk, you know, to the locals. Um, because if you're seen with them, then at the minimum, you'll be followed. At the minimum, you may be visited upon. And there is this fear, you know. So let me, I mean, you know, so to answer your question also at the, at the same time, so, is that, you, you know, it, 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 there was a feeling of fear that I have never sensed. You know, and I come from Kashmir. You know, there's fear there too. You know, but it is, this was all pervading. You know, and, and it was very strange. You go to, and, and you didn't feel like going. Now, when we went to the village of Tuyuk, 
for example, um, I bought some um, raisins, you know, Kishmish, uh, which is called Kishmish, by the way, <laughs> there too. And, and I went to buy it, and there was a little bit of bastard, you know, with the uh, lady who was selling. Uh, and we chatted and, and so forth. But it was very furtive, and it was not as if, uh, you know, she wanted to talk anymore. And absolutely no way you feel comfortable talking politics at all. You know, um, our guide, for example, would once in a while talk to us and things. I had another experience on another trip. In fact, the trip that I went with uh, ICS on, uh, where a woman was sitting next to me. And after a while, she made out that I was not a Uyghur, uh, not a spy. Uh, you know, when I said I was from Kashmir, there was a little bit of, oh, achha, you know, what kind of place is Kashmir? So I said, well, you know, like you have breads, we have breads, and so, you know, commonalities. And so, and then div she divulged, you know, and she said this, I'm saying this to you, do not repeat it, do not repeat it, ever, you know, uh, because we'd be identified. We were sitting next to each other on a flight, you know, and she was talking about when, I don't know if you remember the incident, I think it was in 2014. Oh, so uh, 13 or 14, when um, uh, a bus uh, went into a police station in Kashgar and blew up the whole thing. She was referring to that, and she was referring to the cause of that. The cause of that was that a woman and her daughter were walking in the Kashgar market uh, when the police came and stripped the woman's headscarf. Um, her daughter, being younger, uh, was a little more hot-blooded and debated with the police or probably argued loudly with the police. They were stripped naked right in the crowd and they were asked to, uh, this is what she told me, and she said they were asked to go back home in that state. You know, And then a week later the father, I mean the, the husbands of the two, mother and daughter, loaded a bus, uh, a, a, their car, with thing and drove in. And that was the incident that did it. You know. And she said, I'm sharing it with you because the world needs to know. You met the same yeah. person? Pardon? You met the same person? No, 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 I didn't oh, meet her. No, no. But I, I was just saying on the previous okay. visit. So that in terms of that. Um, the world order and you know uh, I mean sorry, uh, what do the Chinese hope to achieve? Is that uh, the question, yes. Uh, what do states want to achieve? You know, really, it, it's a it's a large question. I think that control, uh, Chinese foreign policy, we know very well. I mean, they've taken care of uh, now. They feel uh, the land area, you know, um, and by cushioning um, the center of power uh, with Tibet, with Xinjiang, with Mongolia, and to a certain extent also with Manchuria. You know, when, when go. and that has been a policy since the early Qing days. Um, you know, the sort of 18th century onwards is is to protect the 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 center, the agricultural center, uh, by dominating these regions and things. And I think that it's an ongoing case of that. Uh, the feeling now seems to be that okay, we are more or less secure there. So if there's any hint of opposition, international or domestic there, we stamp it out so hard, you know, that it will never arise. And we will go to the South China Seas, you know, which is what the U.S. is completely reacting to. And along with U.S., thank you very much, Delhi, you know, following in its footsteps, uh, you know, and things to react to that. And so it's a policy um, that, I mean, and I think that it is policy achievement, you know, is, is uh, what uh, they are. If there is a crisis, God knows what will happen. You know, the, the Soviet uh, crisis was a rotten uh, sort of internal rot that had set in from an economic point of view uh, that we were all shielded against. Economic rot is not exactly what you can refer to in the case of the People's Republic of China. You know, but certainly the, 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 that the strings are going to break at some point. You know, the question is how much damage will be done by then uh, and, uh, you know, what's going to happen. Uh, we all know, I mean, the New York Times, the London Review, <laughs> Review of Books, everybody is covering this. Even, um, you know, German and uh, French uh, newspapers are covering the Xinjiang uh, sort of scenario. 
who's you know who's reacting to it, which government is reacting to it. I don't know, you know, and it's because I think corporate. Uh, well, the, 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 the new sort to get into the you know uh, world order thing is that the new convergence is between commercial interest and political interest. You know, a complete con uh, sort of convergence uh, where the two don't seem they don't seem to be any different anymore. You know, takes uh, take Trump's uh, reaction to Khashoggi, you know, and his uh, slaughter, and openly saying, openly saying that because of our commercial interests, we cannot monkey with this, you know. And so, the kill journalists be done. I don't know, I mean, uh, uh, the new world order and the agenda, I really, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a very, I have started to go back to my undergraduate day readings uh, of uh, people like uh, Huxley, you know, and, um, you know, 1984, Brave New World, um, and others. And it's, a, it's eerie uh, as to how much of it is true. I mean, I feel a little like an undergraduate now uh, talking about, but it is this amazing sort of thing about comfort, the search for comfort, happiness, or whatever you want to call it, you know, and the search for power converging. Uh, this has been studied uh, hugely by a lot of people, uh, some of it talking about inverted dictatorships, where actually the 1% or the, or the very rich make it possible, you know, uh, so that uh, dictatorship is actually light. Uh, you know, if that sounds familiar to you, um, and things. So I don't know, I mean, I tend to feel, I mean, I must say it's been 10 days since I returned. Uh, you know, and I've been trying to absorb it uh, all, but it, that is the kind of reaction I have, uh, you know, and and I, I just don't see how it is going to be reacted to, you know, what is the altruism uh, that is going to react to uh, the kind of things that are happening, and not just in China, I mean, you know, I think, I think there are other states um, that can be included in this whole picture. Two or three questions, if I may. Uh, uh, did you see any restaurants that showed that they sell pork or don't sell pork? That uh, are all sorts of ways banned or only black and complete face covering? Like the colorful ones are okay. Uh, was your bus driver and guide Uyghur or Han? I mean, I, I'm not sure if I should respond to these questions. And in Kashgar, particularly, did you see any projects being labeled under BRI, actually? Hmm. Um, pork. Yeah, I mean, it's open is. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, thank you. I'm Yogen Kumar. I actually uh, spent nearly six years in, uh, in what you call Western Pakistan and dealt with it far longer. Uh, you know, regarding this question that you said about the political and economic interest, to me what is most fascinating actually is that now the, uh, the Western ambassadors based in Beijing have officially written to the Chinese Foreign Office to say they want to actually inquire as to what's happening in China. Now there's something which to me is quite unprecedented because even earlier when there were human rights issues and all the rest of it, uh, uh, they dare not raise that. So I think this is perhaps a sign of the time that things are changing a little bit. Uh, you know, of course, you just come back, but I understand that you follow China. I'm just a little curious. Of course, uh, Xinjiang, the reason why the Chinese state should be what's doing or Tibet, why they're doing that. But the Chinese state is a servant state anyway. I mean, they do servants of the Han population as well. And they would be the Uyghurs and Tibetans in that population as well. So I'm wondering, I mean, how do you compare the level of servants? Because that also is a degree of control that they exercise. So in one way, of course, there's a degree is more. But the fact of the matter is that in one way, the state feels insecure internally. That's why you find this degree of servants all over. Thank you. I have a question actually, Siddiq, because you were following this area for a yes. long time. Yes. Uh, early 2000 and I think 2008 or so, they were projecting 
Urumti, at least part of Urumti and Erdavchia, if you remember that place. As the religious unity place and the religion, especially one or two mosques funded by the Saudi Arabia and other places. What happened to those places? Is there any uh, recognition of uh, the Muslim culture or they want to showcase it anymore? Thank you. Uh, did you uh, recognize yourself? I mean, identify yourself before. Uh, Reason sir, I am Saurabh from ITPP. Uh, we have been receiving Sorry. reports. Okay. Can, can you just finish? We will get back to you. Okay. Yeah, I'm Surya, I am a journalist. Uh, we uh, heard, read a lot of reports about Han Chinese being settled in large numbers in uh, uh, Xinjiang. Did you come across any evidence of this? I mean, did you see large numbers of Han? Uh, I am Saurabh from ITPP. We have been receiving reports about the presence of these re education camps. There are, like, there are reports like millions of Uyghurs are being interned and now China has all finally accepted that these are vocational training uh, centers. So what is your take on that and could you actually, you had that feel of uh, these camps being run there? Thank you. Thank you. Um, pork um, and um, you know, sort of, you know, whether it's that, it's all over the place. You know, as a Muslim I don't eat pork. You know, and whenever I go to China, I'm very cautious because even the veggies that are cooked, if they're cooked in oil, they're cooked in pork fat, you know, and stuff. But as I said, I mean, our guide uh, and driver were always local uh, Uyghurs, you know, and Muslim, except in one instance. Um, and so, therefore, I felt safe, <laughs> you know, from the point of view of eating pork or whatever. I mean, I don't go into a fit if I eat pork by mistake. I mean, in fact, I ate ham for a long time until I found out it was pork. Uh, you know, and so, but, uh, you know, I, I don't go into a pack, but the point was that, uh, you know, I just don't feel comfortable eating it. So, there's no restriction on this at all. Uh, it says Muslim uh, whatever, you know, diet whatever. The guide did tell us that if you happen to be an overly devout Muslim, you were forced to eat pork in order to demonstrate uh, that you're not a hardliner, you know. So that is being done, you know, in some instances. We weren't. Um, the, uh, sorry, you said something about the Uyghur or the Han? Did you? Yeah, the, on the bus drivers. But the way that all, all, all ways land or only the black ones or... Sorry? Oh, the veil. Um, the veil, well, it doesn't matter if it was a very colorful veil also. I mean, the woman I showed you, she was wearing a very colorful veil. You know, they were made to take it off, you know, and stuff. So that, that is not. And as far as the BRI, I mean, I didn't find any evidence of it uh, because I, I guess I wasn't looking for it. Uh, but there is a rush. I think to two things. I mean, the Kashgar old city has been completely demolished and is being reconstructed as a trendy sort of, you know, in Delhi, the Hauskos village uh, sort of look. You know, some of it has that look. It's empty right now because I think that they're just in the process of doing it again. This in the last year and a half, um, and and it may be for the PRI tourist rush or something. I mean, that they're thinking about. I, I mean, and here I must. I digress slightly to say that I was very um, sort of surprised w when uh, Delhi rejected the BRI uh, and I was always saying, yeah, listen, I mean, this is the way to go. You know, this may be the way to go uh, because, uh, it, 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 you know, it, it takes into account borderlands, borderlanders uh, as opposed to boundaries and lines and so forth. Uh, but. After having visited Xinjiang, around which the entire PRI uh, is, um, you know, sort of created, I am a little bit skeptical. You know, I think that there are still ways, maybe, to get around it. I need to sober up a little bit and maybe, you know, think about it a little bit again. But I'm not that enthusiastic because one has to choose, you know, between some sort of a moral imperative at some point, you know, and uh, the economic considerations, you know, and what the world has to answer for it, I don't know. I mean, uh, in some ways it is wide-ranging, it really brings the entire weight uh, of uh, Chinese civilization of thinking on world affairs uh, behind it. And so I think it's not uh, exactly a lightweight uh, proposition. Uh, but 
you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what uh, what it is. Um, I have something about uh, inquiry by the West and neighbors. Um, the, the Western nations have, uh, yes, I mean, most recently, yes, most recently they have attacked it. I was discouraged by two things. You know, one is the United States was excluded from it. No, they were there. Oh, they were there also? Okay. They were there. Not a single China, neighbor to China, including India, has done a thing about it. And not a single hypocritical Muslim regime has had the guts to speak out about it. So therefore, I mean, that kind of state-to-state -state relations is very discouraging. You know, to say the least. And I think there uh, one has to be critical about India in terms of, you know, where, and I'm a big advocate of India quickly developing something that I've started calling a Himalayan uh, policy of some sort, you know, so that then they can have some sort of a Tibet policy, so that they can have then some sort of a China policy. You know, right now I think we're bereft. I think we're bereft of a policy. We just do whatever. The Chinese, I mean, the, the Americans are doing, they say, yeah, okay, fine, you know, we're together on this as the largest, the bulkiest, uh democracy and the oldest democracy. And I think that that has its own sort of implications. Um, I'm sorry, I, I can't read my writing. Uh, Urumqi protected, etc., Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Yeah, protected as the window of uh, Muslim culture. Oh, yeah, well, it still is. And not only is, but so is Kashgar uh, projected as the window. Uh, as I learned on my last visit, not the one before, the last one that I made uh, recently, uh, is that Kashgar, I mean, there is a certain level of confidence in, in the Chinese state uh, that, you know, is, is quite something difficult to fathom. Um, and that is that anybody can uh, go in Kashgar and strike a deal with a foreign country. They supposedly don't have to go through Beijing. You know, I haven't tried it out. I mean, I don't know whether it's real or it's just uh, talk. Uh, but uh, that is what we were told in a meeting, you know, that, that we were sitting in, is that you can strike a deal, you know, with foreign countries. Imagine Delhi saying, okay, fine, you know, if Kashmir wants, they can strike an economic deal with Switzerland or whatever, you know, as a, Apparently, and apparently certain things have happened in that direction. Maybe it's a reflection of, you know, how um, uh, confident the Chinese state is of the occupation and the degree of occupation uh, level. On that note, Han Chinese and uh, being evidence of Han Chinese, uh, there being more Han Chinese, I mean, uh, demographic flooding, in other words, all over the place. You know, uh, when I went first 20 years ago, uh, or even earlier, I think in the in the late 1990s, uh, when I went, um, the Uyghur population uh, was somewhere to the tune of 80 percent. Uh, I mean, the uh, population of Xinjiang to the tune of 70 or 80 percent was Uyghur, and 30 percent Han Chinese. Today, it's flipped over. It is 90% Han Chinese, uh, or 80% Han Chinese and 20% Uyghur in Urumqi. However, in places like Yarkan, in places like um, Khotan and others, it's flipped over again uh, to being about 30% uh, Han and 70-80% uh, uh, Uyghur. As a result, you are not allowed to go out into the countryside. You know, your group is not allowed to split. Uh, one day when we were in Khotan, uh, one of the uh, group members had gone up for a walk and she was immediately stopped by the hotel staff and told to go back in, into the compound, because she was not allowed to walk out, you know, of, of the place. So, therefore, there is that insecurity, security sort of, you know, seesawing, um, in the sense that uh, you're not allowed um, I mean, uh, in that, uh, where, where the Han presence is very high, you're free to go wherever you want. When it's low, at one point we were stopped uh, from going to a Buddhist site, 30 kilometers outside of Kashgar, uh, simply because um, they were not sure uh, that, um, 
you know, uh, that they would allow, uh, uh, I mean, that they were not sure that, uh, what, that there would not be a crowd of people or, you know, the group separates somehow and talk to them individually or something like that. Uh, you know, so th those things uh, do happen, you know, um, I think. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, if, if, if the Chinese had it their way, they would make it 90, and it wouldn't take very much to make it 90% Xinjiang, Han Chinese, uh, you know, and 10% Uyghur. You know, it's not. When I first went to Urumqi, you could feel very comfortable walking into any restaurant, uh, you know, and eating Muslim food, you know. Um, not now. You know, you have to actually look for it. Um, and things. Pre-education camps, um, a very big reality, you know, and I, I mean, when I was in Uzbekistan, I met uh, somebody who's become a very good friend um, and who ran a business and she asked me, can you please check because I've not heard from my husband who lives in Kashgar. Um, and I, when I went to Kashgar, she gave me a contact. Uh, the, the contact came and met me at a restaurant, made sure that he met me in a crowd, and then we talked to each other, you know. And the husband had been to an education camp, uh, education camp, you know. Uh, he was, in, in, fortunately, in good shape in terms of he was not beaten, he was not, you know, his food, everything was given to him on time. Except why? Because he was being forced to teach Mandarin you know, to the kids, I mean, to, to those who didn't speak Mandarin, a large percentage of Uyghurs don't speak Mandarin, you know. So he was being taught, um, sort of forced to teach Mandarin, had been there for 10 years, and they hoped that within two months that they would be free. He was allowed to receive phone calls twice a month, and he was allowed to visit family uh, visits from family members once a month, you know. Uh, conditions in the camp, the man refused to speak. He would say, I don't know anything about it. You know, and I didn't obviously want to press him any further on it. So in that sense, it touched me very closely. You know, and the patterns don't change. My own father was taught, was recruited uh, in 1950, uh, would have been about 55, 57, between 55 and 57. Uh, we were in Lhasa at the time, at my maternal path. He was recruited to teach Marx and Lenin uh, to Tibetan nobility in Lhasa. You know, and had to run away, you know, and not, he, because he wouldn't be allowed to otherwise go, you know. And so, so he left by a stealth of night, you know, and uh, I, I guess, you know, with the two children that they had at the time, I must say, I don't remember anything of that uh, and things, but uh, it must have been exciting. So uh, these patterns, these histories do repeat themselves wrongly, on the wrong side, unfortunately. You know. Why? Yeah. Why? Yeah, I'm Vijay Naik, journalist. Uh, you, have, you said that you have been going to Xinjiang and that area for the last 20 years. Uh, everybody knows that uh, Xinjiang is a province where natural gas and oil is an abundance actually. And the uh, Chinese are trying to exploit uh, those natural resources. Mm -hmm. uh, how for those natural resources or the money Chinese have put in the development of Xinjiang and Urumqi, number one. As they really proudly say that we have done a lot of things for Tibet. Once you go to uh, Lhasa, you can see a lot of things, developments have taken place. Such developments are taken place in Urumqi and Xinjiang, as you see, for the last 20 years. How you look at that? And secondly, you talked about the nightmare, actually. Uh, and the, the, how the, the whole thing is scary, you see, when you're walking and talk to people, it's scary. Do you think that uh, the East Turkestan movement, which was there for a long time, is dead now? Thank you. Yes, uh, Siddiq. Uh, <coughs> okay, my name is Monish. I'm an entrepreneur. But uh, okay, my question to Siddiq is uh, basically looking at the strategic aspects of what uh, this visit represents, maybe, or the region represents. 
Uh, where do you see the degrees of surveillance which now exist between different uh, governments? <coughs> where does that lead to? Where, what is the project that actually can make a difference to their lives or are their lives condemned to be the way they are? And uh, if this Orwellian, let's say, uh, compromise or uh, that we all, all exist in now, where does it lead to? Where, where do you go from here? I'm Ashok Teku. I come from Kashmir, as I said. It. I have been to all the places, right from Turban to Xinjiang, going to Urumqi, Kashigarhati, and all those places. That was the best time I had been because the Chinese signs were being removed and replaced by the Uyghur signs that time. And later on, I found and uh, wherever we, I went as a student, so we were very much welcomed. And it was, I felt as if I was in Kashmir. In fact, on 15th August, I was in Kashmir. And so I could hear the songs, Hindi songs being there and all. There were lots of Kashmiri families who had ties, and because that time we could speak easily to them and all that. And they said that they were from Kashmir, Hasnabad in Kashmir, and they, they could get in the letters. And I wonder whether there is any such relationship still existing there. My second thing is that uh, the leadership at that time wanted that we have got so much to offer dry fruits and melons and all that. Why do we have direct fights with? Sirnagar and Kashigar or Delhi and Kashigar and all that. So I wonder whether you would be recommending or writing all such things. Thank you. That's what last question. Are you planning Uyghur course in Kashmir industry? Anyone in the back room? Yeah, here please. So I'm Rani Singh, a PhD student from Jaina. So I'm just a very small question. So how do you see the uh, Uyghurs who are spread outside Xinjiang you know, in search of jobs or for education, mainly in the cities? So during my interaction in the universities with the students, with Uyghurs or the, uh, with the people working in Xinjiang restaurants, they seem quite happy and satisfied with the development on one hand. And on the other hand, they're also quite open and free to talk, especially if you're an Indian, they will always happily talk to you. So how do you see them presently? Are they conditioned in a way where they are totally into like the Han Chinese or they are po they are somewhere stuck between uh, and their own whatever they get from Xinjiang or their own region. And on one hand, when we see in the cities the other Muslims, the white Muslims, their faith is respected, they are not taken care of, and also the uh, foreigners, uh, foreign Muslims, like you will have special prayer rooms for them, you will have special halal kitchens for them, and every special care, uh, I mean, care taken for the other Muslims. So how is this? Just, how do you see them? Any further question? the last yes. <laughs> um, evidence of develop evidence of development in um, Xinjiang absolutely all over the place and uh, there's no doubt and which is why I use that quote you know there's plenty of everything but nothing quite tastes the same you know tastes quite the same uh, the idea being that you know it is no I mean I think that what they do to corruption in China, at least in the lower uh, sort of rungs of power, uh, has put the fear of God or whatever, you know. But also there is a sense of nation building, you know, which is not, which is absent in South Asia. For, for I don't know for what reason and things. And that you cannot, you know, it's not people holding a gun to your head and saying, you know, you will build this road or else, you know. There's something going on which is strange, which I must admit, I don't understand, I don't know uh, how that works. But yes, so the roads are the best. I mean, you know, they, they will compete with roads anywhere in the world. You know, the, uh, the infrastructure in terms of electricity, water, etc., absolutely fine. And there's a certain bit of pride, I mean, degree of pride that is taken in that, uh, you know, and things. So, 
I, I mean, you know, it's it's um, uh, it, it's not uh, uh, sort of as if that there haven't been quote unquote economic returns, uh, you know, but dignity is something. I mean, you know, which foreign policy, domestic policy, don't necessarily take care of, you know, address um, and things. And I think that that is what is, as I showed you, you know, the bazaars are overflowing. I mean, my, my pictures are bad pictures, uh, you know, the, the kind of food, the kind of things that are available. And, you know, I've, I've, I've never tasted fruit uh, anywhere, in root Kashmir, uh, you know, as I have in Central Asia. You know, it's, it's just amazing. And that is still very much there. It's not, I don't know whether it's organic or not, but it tastes bloody good, you know, um, and things. So I, I think that there is that uh, very much, you know. Um, as far as the East Pakistan movement, I must say, I don't know, I, you know, I, I'm not, uh, I must say that my study of Central Asia stopped in 1400. Um, after Temur died, I don't, uh, that, that was not, it is only in the last five to ten years that I've tried to catch up, uh, you know, with my understanding of, of Central Asia, simply because I think, uh, you know, that's what makes even 1400 interesting um, and things. But, um, I, you know, the East Pakistan movement, I, you know, I'm sure it's there, you know, and I think we will find it. We find the movement, it's interesting. Uh, the resistance in Tibet has been self-immolation, uh, you know, sort of like a, a statement. Um, I don't, I mean, you know, these are Muslims, uh, I, I know some Muslims, uh, you know, and self-immolation is not going to be, uh, you know, sort of thing. Um, I, I, I don't know, and it's not, it's not going to be a peaceable reaction. Um, but a lot of people have told me, people who know better, I have told me that they're sitting on a powder again, right there in Xinjiang, um, you know, which goes to the question about the degrees of surveillance, you know, between uh, the Han and uh, the non-Han. Um, the kind of surveillance, I've been to Beijing, I've been to Shanghai and so forth, yes, there is surveillance of the Han too. But every incident that I mentioned, of the three that I mentioned, have to do with Xinjiang have to do with Uyghurs and have to do with Muslims, period, you know. So, and there are many other instances of that that I could give you examples of, but I don't really need to. All you need to do is read New York Times, you know, and, and uh, other uh, papers that are covering them. Um, and they're not lies. You know, incidentally, in one place, I believe it was uh, in Kashgar, we ran into Buckley. Christopher Buckley, who wrote a series in the New York Times, uh, you know, three, a series of three articles or something. It was very interesting, you know, but I didn't want to include too much on it because I'm sure he's not very comfortable, but he's lived in Beijing for 20 years, you know. So that's a bit contradictory, you know. He's allowed to say, he's allowed to report, he's allowed to say some very damning things. I don't know what the future holds for him, you know, uh, in terms of China itself. So that uh, thing. Um, any relationship, as I said, you know, we ourselves had, because our family had property, and things, but that was all taken care of in, in, in the early to mid 1940s uh, because of this, the World War II, China nationalist versus communist, and all that. And I think that everybody was exited during that time, some of whom came and settled, as I said, in um, Yarkandi uh, Sarai, in, in Safakadan, in Kashmir, and landed. I mean, I remember them coming, I, I don't remember that, I, mean, I was born. But I, I, I've been told that when they came, they would give you two sheep for one piece of bread, because they were so sick and tired of eating meat, you know, while they were wandering. Uh, for a couple of years, you know, on because they got lost uh, coming down uh, south, to, you know, towards towards the and things. So, um, you know, I, I don't think there are. Uh, on a previous visit, I did manage to go to Yarkand, and I did try to locate the house of my great uncle's uh, wife, you know, whom he never saw again once he came back to Kashmir um, and things. And I was able to locate the house, but not 
much more than that. You know, she was gone, long gone uh, since then, and things. Um, as far as direct flights for fruit and, and some, I mean, you know, I dreamt about it when I first went because I saw and in, I inquired in Uzbekistan, uh, and, apparent, and, and this was about 18 years ago, they grew 300,000 tons of fruit every year. 100,000 tons they consumed. Another 100,000 tons they um, exported. And the last 100,000 tons rotted because they didn't know what to do with it. So my dream was to fly the fruit to Srinagar, you know, um, and then use the technology that was available then. And I started a food technology course at the university that I was working in at the time um, in order to scan make jams out of pickles out of whatever, you know, of, of fruit that, that would come in. And I thought that that, our flight, would make a lot of sense, you know, if, if one did it. But that was about 12 years ago. Uh, I was younger uh, and more idealistic. I don't think that, you know, it's... I still think that the path to resolving something like Kashmir is even something like BRI, you know, where borders sort of become porous, where the people on both sides gain and so forth. And I, uh, that's what I used to push um, and still do to, to a large extent. I think that it's a, if you take uh, something like Kashmir out of the India-Pakistan paradigm uh, and put it in the South and Central Asia paradigm, it looks completely different, you know, and you don't need to look at borders. Uh, as as being changed or something, you know. Um, but I mean, after what has happened in Kashmir in the last 24 hours, you know, one wonders. So um, we go to diaspora. Again, I must say I'm not in touch with them. You know, the the young Uyghur uh, students and and people. I doubt uh, that uh, they would feel free to talk very much. Uh, you know, I, um, it's, you know, I'm sure they're happy, you know, they not, they can't pretend to be happy uh, if they're not, uh, you know, but I, I really don't know, I mean, I don't know about how they come, are you talking about to Delhi, um, how these Uyghur diaspora come to Delhi or to? No, the way they settle down the other cities of China. Huh. Oh, different. achha. All right. Oh, in the other cities of China. Well, I know even less about them, you know. Um, and I'm sure that, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm sure that they're surveilled uh, slightly more than, you know, uh, the Han Chinese or whatever. I mean, I, I, I couldn't comment on that, frankly, you know, and things. And I didn't understand your question about foreign Muslims. Yeah, the... Oh, yeah, right, right. Yeah, I, I get it. Uh, Foreign Muslims, I mean, let me tell you, in Xinjiang, if you grow a beard, you're forced to cut it. You know, if, you, if, you, uh, if you're fasting, you're forced not to fast. Then I saw um, a whole bunch of people with beards this long, you know, come for some sort of a meal somewhere. And suddenly I heard that they were talking in Urdu. They were from Pakistan. You know, and looked the very typical image of the Pakistan Taliban or something. You know, so I was like very taken aback, uh, you know, and stuff. And they would allow, they would not interfere with those people. I mean, and many of them apparently are married to, many of them, meaning these were people who had come from Pakistan on a tour of various sites um, and things. And, uh, you know, sort of were enjoying uh, a visit uh, to, to uh, Xinjiang, you know, and I happened to speak to one of them, and he said, "Oh, uh, where are you from?" Uh, to, I mean, I asked him where he was from. He said, "I'm from Kashmir." So I said, "Oh, I'm also from Kashmir," thinking that he was from this side, you know. He said, "Oh, ah, Bambuza Kashmir side," meaning occupied Kashmir, you know. So I said, "Abhi to Bambuza Kashmir side," you know, and he sort of laughed, you know. And then I told him the irony of the picture, you know, is that we are called Mambuza or occupied both in 
Pakistan as well as in India. But when we call ourselves occupied, then everybody objects. <laughs> you know, it's a weird uh, set of circumstances in uh, in uh, foreign relations. So at any rate, so, so yeah. Just to add to what you were saying a minute ago, in Urundu, the Indian government has actually taken so I said, you're the best friends, friends through whatever, yeah. people in the sea and high over the ocean. And all. <laughs> so found, then we found that we a whole large, dilapidated, rambling place back to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And they brought us in there, we pleaded with them and they came out. And we met and we met a great war factory there. And then they told us that they were coming for, for a very long time, for more than a decade. The regular these truckers, they bring someone up all the way, bring it back, and then they have practically colonized a part of that place. And they're doing business, and then he said, Achha, to, uh, uh, and then he said, you know, so Pakistan is not a, uh, not a one off thing. Like, uh, and then they came back to Pakistan, and then they came back to Pakistan, and then they came back to Pakistan, and then they came back to Pakistan. <laughs> well, I think uh, we can have a discussion over a cup of tea because we have run out of time. Um, you know, Professor Sadiq Malik has uh, given us a very different kind of talk. This was not uh, a talk which was very heavy with uh, facts and data, even academic analysis for that matter. Yet, you know, through some very evocative images and insightful comments. He has left us with a real you know, sense of what's happening in Xinjiang. You know, a province in Duras, a place in the Duras, as you put it, uh, you know, Kashkar with his flag mosques, the mosques where you know, faithful are not allowed to visit during their prayer times. Uh, Place where mosques have been covered with a bar. Place, you know, as you described it, uh, where change has been so rapid that uh, you feel the weight has changed. And following out of inner man or killing of inner man. Uh, it's rather a disturbing picture you have painted, yet, you know, you also came out with this you know, uh, conclusion that. Uh, the Chinese state is relatively confident about its ability to, to handle the present situation in Xinjiang. It's not you know, so worried that it's closing up the place. Instead, you know, it's allowing you know, uh, Xinjiang to become uh, a very major part of the Belt and Road Initiative. As you said, people don't have to go to, to Beijing to strike deals. They can go directly to Xinjiang and strike deals. So it's, uh, very complex <laughs> picture that you have uh, projected for us. We really appreciate that. You know, much food for thought in what you have done. <clears throat> this conversation can, in fact, carry on for quite some time. Thank you very much for you know, sharing with us uh, your impressions of your recent uh, visit to Xinjiang. You know, your, uh, understanding of the place, its history, its evolution, and where it stands today. Thanks a lot. We'll, we'll continue this dialogue in ICS, and please join me in giving a big round of applause to